Nick, 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 Nickelodeon. From Nickelodeon Studios in Burbank, California, this is the Nickelodeon Animation Podcast. Hey, I'm your host, Hector Navarro. Welcome to the podcast. We've had so many guests that have been hugely impactful to the history of Nickelodeon and Nicktoons, but my guest today is an Emmy-winning animator, writer, director, producer, and creator who's been hugely impactful to modern animation, period. She's worked on classic shows like The Powerpuff Girls, Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, and developed My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, a pop culture phenomenon to say the least. So let's get right to it. Here's Lauren Faust. My daughter's only three months old, oh, so great. I'm still on my leave. Oh, so beautiful. I'm just okay. usually home <laughs> all day taking care of a baby. Which awesome. I kind of love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here. What kind of stuff did you enjoy as a kid? When did you look at animation and go, I love this stuff? Well, it's not that I looked at animation and loved it. It's just that I never stopped loving it. Um, I was just drawn to it immediately since I can remember. I don't remember not watching cartoons. Mm-hmm. It was flipping through the channels. I remember I hated MASH because <laughs> MASH came on when the cartoons were over. When the cartoons were over, and, yep. I, <laughs> and I ended up hating it. Um, I never watched it as an yeah. adult because I'm like, oh, Flintstones is over. But I remember I had to be a little closeted about it by the time I was in high school because yeah. I had a very, very young brother who was born when I was 10. So I would go like, I don't love DuckTales. I have a five-year-old brother, so I have to watch it. <laughs> Um, but uh, I think the stuff that stuck out to me was, you know, the classics. I just Looney Tunes and Disney movies. Yeah. I mean, that that sounds so typical, but that was what really resonated with me mm-hmm. um, because they were just so beautifully produced. And Warner Brothers cartoons is just that excellent sense of humor. Early Hanna Barbera, the Tom and Jerry cartoons, um, yeah. Flintstones. But like once they started, you know the production process got so fast and yeah. a little formulaic that like <laughs> I sort of stepped away from Hannah. I, sure. I watched it, but I didn't love it. The stuff that re- really resonated was the Looney Tunes and, and Disney movies. So would you say that that was kind of some of your creative influences coming up? Was there anything outside of animation that you were drawn to creatively? Actually, when I was young, uh, books, I uh, started eating up fantasy genre books real fast. Uh, mm-hmm. The Chronicles of Narnia like, changed my life. <laughs> Um, awesome. And then when I got older, you know, The Hobbit, and then I'd always be looking around for other fantasy stuff to get into. Mm-hmm. Uh, comic books, superhero comic books. I was insane about X-Men. Yes. Um, my favorite by far. I used to sneak into my older brother's bedroom. He was one of those comic <laughs> collectors who put everything yeah. in the bag and everything. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd sneak into his room and be very careful about taking them out and putting them back in because I didn't want him to know that in I was... The- in the right order, you got to put them in that right order. I, and, I did, yeah. and I found out later that my younger brother was doing the exact same thing. <laughs> so those were oh, those were all huge influences on me. And yeah. then by the time I was like twelve or thirteen, Monty Python, and um, I remember one of the big things that really changed my life was um, Coen Brothers uh, Raising Arizona. That yeah. somehow just smacked me in the face. I think it was fourteen when I saw it, and it just like opened up whole new worlds to me about what stories could be in filmmaking. And not that I was thinking of filmmaking but just like the 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 tone of it and the style of it like just went like where did this come from this exists i need more of that (laughs) (laughs) what was it like working on the iron giant did you have any idea of what was going to happen to it that it would eventually become this classic but then when it came out that it wouldn't make any money. While we were working on it, I think everybody had a feeling that it was, you know, I mean, we not even a feeling. We were all completely aware that it was very special and it was very different, uh, especially for the time. And everybody was very excited to work for Brad Bird. Like, you know, this was his feature film debut, but he already had a reputation and he just had an energy and an enthusiasm about him that just made everybody uh, more optimistic and excited about the project. I think we were all, well, at least I was, because mm-hmm. I was still very young. I was, think I was 23 or 24. 
and I was hanging out with the other 23 and 24 year olds <laughs> and we were all like yeah this is all this is the alternative and yeah. we're going to show everybody animation can be sophisticated yeah. and not for babies and you know people are going to love this and it's going to be great and it wasn't so much that we thought that it was going to be successful but we thought that it was we were hopeful that it would kind of maybe change things at least a little bit and then we saw the ads <laughs> and we went oh no yeah. cuz the exact same thing happened on Cats Don't Dance was right. um you know we had a lot of hope for that movie too cuz at that time Cats Don't Dance was like yeah we're bringing cartoony back yes and um then we saw the ads we're like oh my god it looks they're making it look so stupid <laughs> and Iron Giant it wasn't that they were making it stupid they just made it look nothing special right um and i remember when i was a little kid and i would see ads for movies that were not disney movies mm -hmm. and i would just go boy that looks lame that looks lame they're trying so hard to be a disney movie and right. they're gonna totally fail you know i was like you know when i was like 10 yeah i was like somehow a snob already so we saw the ads for that i remember there was one where they just had rock me like a hurricane yeah. over <laughs> the so, you know just some cuts and we we're like that doesn't represent what the movie is at all and that song is 10,000 years old and it was but it wasn't old enough for the nostalgia factor yeah. <laughs> and it was like oh, what are they what are they doing and i think we had a pretty strong sense at that point that it might not do so well i remember yeah. there was a time where everybody was just kind of holding on for dear life going they're talking about it on ain't it cool news maybe yeah. there's a chance maybe there's a chance but over the years you know i, I saw how it was uh, coming to the attention it, it, it was it was growing as a classic you know yeah. people it was it's that you know dream of dreams of failed films that are that are really fantastic that it's like somebody dug it out of the dumpster and went who threw this away yeah. <laughs> you know and it grew in appreciation and grew and grew and grew and, and that was very vindicating you know you can make something sophisticated and different and for older audiences or for all audiences yeah. but more you know just not pandering and talking down to little kids yeah. so it was nice to see that it ultimately worked I mean not financially right. but <laughs> artistically <laughs> You've been quoted as saying, cartoons for girls don't have to be a puddle of schmooshy, cutesy wootsy, goody two shoeness. Girls like stories with real conflict. Girls are smart enough to understand complex plots. Girls aren't as easily frightened as everyone seems to think. When did you notice that there was a difference between a girl's show and a boy's show? When I was very little, because I, I have three brothers, no sisters. And I watched the stuff they watched, and I loved the stuff they loved, and that was the most compelling, interesting stories to me. But I played with girl things. I played with, and you know, I, I want to say right now, I'm, I'm categorizing boy and girl, and of course those lines cross. Right. You know, I, exactly. it, it <laughs> absolutely, positively does. But, you know, in general, these sure. are what people think. And, and that's bad, totally. actually. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's completely like the toy aisle, the pink aisle, the blue aisle. Like, it's not mm -hmm. cool. But like I was saying, I played with the girl things. Uh, wasn't a Barbie girl. Strawberry Shortcake, My Little Pony just mm -hmm. took over my world. And then I would watch the shows and I would go, these are garbage. <laughs> I was like eight. I was eight and I hated them. And I was like, why can't My Little Pony be more like... Transformers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't mean like the fighting in the war, but at least, you know, the the ideas behind it. Yeah. You know, it shouldn't just be about so and so got her feelings hurt and now we have to make her feel better, mm -hmm. which is what I felt like everything for girls was and in a lot of cases still is. Yeah. Um, and I hated it. It made me mad because <laughs> I wanted that stuff for me too. I wanted to see more girl characters in my and the boy stuff. And mm -hmm. and it it's funny because I think it kind of led me to what I do for a living because I used to watch those shows or read those comic books and I would make up my own female characters to put into those stories. Wow. And instead of paying attention in class, I'd be drawing and writing those stories out. Mm -hmm. um, but making up these girl characters to fit 
fit in those types of stories a little bit more. You know, that was a big thing for me because on top of the fact that these shows were bad, I felt like they contributed to this idea that, you know, girls suck. Girls are lame and things for girls are are um, are are wimpy and boring and bad in light of that girls are boring and bad like like comparing a boy to a girl is an insult yeah and i think making that stuff lousy adds to that Mm -hmm. and that made me mad too Mm -hmm. (laughs) so yeah i've got all this like righteous anger (laughs) behind my work (laughs) yeah what has it been like to see the past 15 years the past decade to sort of see that shift Mm -hmm. what has that been like uh i started my career you know i was so excited to get to work on powerpuff girls because i think it reflected what i wanted to see totally so um like i was working on iron giant when powerpuff girls came out and i was Mm -hmm. following it and i was buying all the stuff (laughs) and then like when i had the opportunity to to apply for a storyboard position there. I was so excited. Mm-hmm. So um, that's where I met my husband, mm-hmm. creator of Powerpuff Girls, Craig McCracken. And when Powerpuff Girls were done, Craig and I were both like, all right, we proved it. You know? Yeah. Stuff, people watch, uh, boys watch things for girls. The world has changed. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> you know, there's, you know, that's it. Totally. You know, we don't have to go back to those ideas because somebody let us try and we proved that it would work mm-hmm. and it just went right back. Yeah. You know, even Cartoon Network, like Powerpuff Puff Girls at the time, even though Powerpuff Girls was the biggest success they had and the biggest money maker, like right out the gate, we don't want girl shows. Yeah. Um, when we were working in development and like a dope, I was developing girl shows. So I spent years developing girl shows, trying to sell girl shows and looking for these little windows of like, yes, for girls that would last about six months, then I'd be developing something. And well, we don't want yeah. girls anymore. And then the project's over. Oof. Um, That happened over and over and over and over again um, for years, for years and years and years. I got really disheartened. I even left animation for a while and tried to work in toys because I was like, nobody's going to tell me girls don't like dolls. (laughs) You know, everybody's telling me girls don't like cartoons. What was that like, working in toys? Awful. (laughs) (laughs) I I tried to do it independently. Sure. It was... was, um, I imagine it's a lot of the same old school decisions. Mm -hmm. Girls don't like XYZ come from a lot of toy people. It is. Well, they've got all their market research behind it, and they Mm. also have, this is what I learned in toys, was Mm -hmm. that they have the buyers. So, there's the toys that they make, and no matter how they have windows of open-mindedness and people who want to try something different, Target will just go, well, We'll buy, you know, 500 units right. if it's orange, but we'll buy 10,000 units if it's pink. Oh. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that, like, my project was, you know, the dolls I was trying to pitch were space-themed, mm-hmm. and the pro- the predominant color was blue. Sure. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> um, and it was just that was right out the gate. More pink, more pink, more pink, more pink, wow. more pink. I think there's a little bit of, of things that I'm seeing that are coming through. It was awesome. Awesome that Barbie has different body types now. Yes. So there's it's the there's been a lot of progress in animation and I think in even in live action television totally. movies and Absolutely. I think toys is still pretty far behind. Yeah, there's still work to be done. <clears throat> well thanks for coming back to animation. That's cool. <laughs> it was an easy Great. decision. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. Mm -hmm. This was a wonderful little show. What was your experience like working on that? You're smiling right now. It's, yeah. (laughs) Foster's was my favorite job. Yeah. It was my absolute favorite job I ever had. Um, A lot of it was just the environment. It was the first time, the first project I worked on where I got in on the ground floor. Great. It was a big part of the development. Um, Mm -hmm. My husband and I worked on it together. We were in love. We were (laughs) were engaged. And it was just, it was, and we had this wonderful crew and just everybody was so excited to be working on the show. So it was just this beautiful environment. And and we had a lot of support from the studio. Yeah. and, And from the the, the network because Craig had so much success with Powerpuff Girls. Totally. So we used to I used to tell Craig all the time, like if anybody pitched this but you, yeah. it would have gotten rejected. Yeah. The support and trust that we got from the studio and the network because we really just got to the creativity on that show just really got to bloom because we had the freedom to experiment mm-hmm. and 
Usually it works. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't. But for them to just kind of step back and go, this is a little different than we're used to, but we think you guys can pull it off and awesome. get that chance. You also work a lot harder when you get that chance yeah. because you're like, you're excited about it. And you're also like, if I screw this up, they're never going to let me do it again. You know? <laughs> and Frankie was based off of you as a human being, right? A little bit? She, she was loosely inspired okay, by Okay, loosely inspired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's she awesome. That's so cool. What is that like? It makes her very easy to write. Okay, great. <laughs> It's very, very easy to write. Just go, what would I? Okay, great. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) The Powerpuff Girls. One of my favorite shows, one of my favorite influences as a kid. How do you go about crafting a show that can be appreciated by both, not just boys and girls, but kids and adults? Well, it it might be a better question for my husband, Craig, at least in terms of the inception. Because Craig created it long before I met him. Yeah, it was the Whoop-Ass Girls back in the It was Whoop-Ass Girls when when he was, well, his student film was (laughs) Whoop-Ass Girls. Um, But, you know, Craig always says that they were kids first and girls second. And he never expected it to blow up the way it did. He wow. kind of thought um, that it would be maybe, if he was lucky, it would be kind of a cult thing <laughs> for stoners, maybe, you know? And um, That makes a lot of sense. Okay, yeah, great. So, and it was also, for him, it was an homage to the 60s Batman uh, yeah. show. So he was kind of making it for himself, and mm-hmm. he brought all his talented buddies in, and, and they were really just... It wasn't so much that they were like, we want to make this appeal to everybody. They were like, we want to make this appeal to ourselves. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Does that same thing apply? Let's just cut right to it, to My Little Pony, Mm -hmm. Friendship is Magic. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, for for listeners who don't know how animation works and the types of process that are involved and the types of people that work on it, you go into a show, do you make it for yourself or do you think, I want to make sure that this can be enjoyed by adults as well as kids? Like, how much thought goes into that? I think that the best cartoons are the ones that the creators made for themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, There's love behind it. There's passion behind it. You know, I picked up My Little Pony after all those years of banging my head against the wall. Nobody (laughs) Wants Girl Cartoons. Hasbro came to me and um, asked me if I wanted to do My Little Pony. I was very nervous about doing something for toys. Mm -hmm. That's just, you know, it's a scary place to be. And there's more interference sure because they got stuff to sell but it was my favorite toy when i was a kid and i was like you know the only people in the world who are gonna say this is 100 percent for girls and we're making it for girls is, is going to be something like my little pony mm-hmm. you know whenever i brought up like bringing in some guy stuff they were like no yeah <laughs> but I, I i do believe that because there's there's love behind it totally. it's it's rather than manufacturing because and and there's some shows that have been successful that have been manufactured you know people look at their market research or you know created in the boardroom um, I always think of the most excellent example of that is uh, the monkeys mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> monkeys was great but yeah. that was that was a manufactured show uh, <laughs> there was no like beautiful vision behind that mm-hmm. so it can happen but I I truly believe that making it for yourself and with my little pony when I developed it, because I didn't think it was going to go anywhere. Right. <laughs> um, when I you, wait, said, you didn't think it was going to go anywhere? How come? Because I thought that I was just going to get noted to death. Sure. I, I thought they were going to rip it to shreds. Yeah. So I'm like, if they're going to rip it to shreds anyway, I might as well just do it the way, the exactly the way I want to do it. Love it. And I'm going to make the show that I would have liked yeah. when I was eight, when I was 10. Yeah. This is what I wanted it to be. Yeah. Um, and then they liked it. I was like, <laughs> I was shocked. They like, they didn't rip it to shreds. They were totally cool with it. And we, we, we went ahead. So awesome. like, yeah, so that's, and I, I try to do that now with all the projects I'm on. I don't just like, hey, a job. Awesome. I go like, mm-hmm. what do you want me to do? Yeah. And what's it about? And are you going to let me do it are you going to give me a hard time you know before i even take the job so it's like because i that's i think it makes the shows better but it also you know it makes you happier when you're making it Do you remember when you first heard that term where did that come from the word brony it came from this very questionable website called 4chan are you familiar with 4chan <laughs> i am unfortunately familiar with 4chan yes okay. I, yeah mm-hmm. 4chan is where bronies were born and and i saw it unfold because like 
I'm desperate for feedback, <laughs> an honest feedback. Oh, so you're just like a creative person. Okay, great. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and validation. Yeah. I'm also desperate for that. So after the first episodes came out, I was mm-hmm. scouring the internet looking for stuff. And I saw like somebody put a YouTube, you know, they put a whole episode up on YouTube, which mm-hmm. is against the law, but they didn't anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and somebody said like, people can't stop talking about this on 4chan. And I had never heard of 4chan before. And I went and I found it and I saw it unfold. I don't know when they started calling themselves bronies, but what I saw that was amazing to me is is what it looked like to me was all these guys who kind of, you know, 4chan's kind of a, tends to be a negative place. And not completely, but it, it's a pretty negative place. Right. Um, it's kind of, it can get real mean. Mm-hmm. And it seemed to me like all these guys were watching it because they wanted to hate it and they wanted to make fun of it. Yeah. And they wanted to just rip it to shreds. Yeah. And then they found themselves going, dudes, I kind of like it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was going to hate it. Right. And I thought the first episode I went, eh, not bad. But then I wanted to see another one. <laughs> and then I wanted to see another one. And they kind of got excited. I, I think the fact that they expected to hate it yeah. and then they liked it wow. made it blow up even more. It was more yeah. than just a, I was expecting to like it and then I did like it. Mm-hmm. It just, they were so excited, I think, by that feeling. These mm-hmm. are just my theories. I don't know. Maybe a I, brony. I think correct you me. might be uh, <laughs> spot on with that. I think yeah. they found each other and other bros are going, bro, me too. I, I like it too. And, <laughs> and know, that's, right? that's, it was like it started blowing. as a dirty little secret. Right. And then they found each other and they wow. went, oh, we, we could be open about it. We, yeah. could, we could talk about Twilight Sparkle and yeah. Rainbow Dash and, like, you know, not feel bad about it because I respect you and you like it too. Yeah. Yeah. That is incredible. <laughs> what an incredible compliment to hear that, so, that to, to, to imagine that somebody may have really wanted to rip this thing apart and then ended up loving it. I mean, that yeah. right there speaks to the quality of the work, yeah. which is pretty awesome. <laughs> kind of uh, make, talk about validation. Yeah, right? From the people like, oh, I'm going to hate this. I love it. It's my favorite. Um, my Little Pony has incredible. Incredible pop culture references, geek references especially. Was that something that was kind of planned from the beginning? No, actually, I only worked on the first two seasons of Mm -hmm. My Little Pony, and I think the pop culture references went way up after my departure. (laughs) So that was not a big plan I had. My my philosophy that my husband and I shared on Fosters and even Powerpuff Girls Mm -hmm. is pop culture references are only okay if somebody who doesn't know the reference can still follow the story. Inter- okay, great. So if it goes over their head, it's if it's a line of dialogue from Star Wars, it better actually fit in the conversation yeah. <laughs> that they're having so that anybody who doesn't know that line. And it's just, I mean, for us, it's just, you know, it's it's not to undermine the story. It's, right. it's I, I don't want the stories I tell to just be big in jokes. I love that philosophy. Is that something that you always sort of had earlier in your career with some of the stuff that you worked on and you went, I don't kind of like this sort of pop culture direction mm-hmm. and I'd rather stick to, again, your early influences were things like yeah. Warner Brothers and Tom and yeah. Jerry and those have pop culture references too, but they're yes. not, they're things that I don't know who Clark Gable was yes. and yet I, you know, yes. can still follow the story in the humor. Mm-hmm. So. I didn't know who, th- then actually, you know, you reminded me that's mm-hmm. one of my arguments for that approach is mm-hmm. like I didn't know who Peter Laurie was. Right. <laughs> but when I watched those cartoons, I was like, oh, he's a creepy guy with big eyes. And That's he's it. creepy and weird and he <laughs> talks really funny. I just thought he was a funny character. Right. So it worked. Right. It still worked and I still enjoyed the cartoon, even though there was a huge pop culture reference in mm-hmm. it. So I truly believe the integrity of story and I don't like the cheap stuff. Yeah. Well, it makes things, <laughs> it makes work timeless Mm -hmm. it makes it classic just throw it on and you'll be fine and you'll get when's the last time you saw aladdin oh well that um, do you know who arsenio hall is like do kids know who arsenio hall is right exactly Music is a integral part of My Little Pony since the first season, and it is often through song that you see major growth and emotion Mm -hmm. in characters. What made that so important to the fabric of the show, the music aspect? Well, you know, I think that was a big part of um, me growing up obsessed with Disney movies. Before I was even taught this in school, I was, or, you know, in college, I was very aware of the fact that the songs pushed the story forward, mm-hmm. that they had to work with the plot. 
and that the songs usually signified a big shift. And when you watch the movies where the songs were just like, hey, we got this big pop star to write a song for us, let's just shove it in there somewhere. <laughs> you know, like, and, but they were more powerful when they indicated a shift. Absolutely. Or illustrated a character's feelings. Totally. That's huge for me. So Hasbro asked me to put music in it. And I was like, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> I've always wanted to do that. Awesome. So, you know, when we were putting the first story together and we were thinking about where we needed songs mm -hmm. that's exactly how i approached it and that's how i had my writers approach it when we were working in the story room like they want songs where are we going to put them usually most episodes that did have songs had one mm -hmm. so we're like what is the key emotional moment that we want to signify with this song mm -hmm. and then there were places like in this episode called winter wrap up where where i was like we have to set up a very important part of how this world works. Mm. And it could be really boring if it's just a bunch of people talking about it. And it can take way too long if we try to unfold it because we only got 22 minutes. <laughs> so we decided to do that in the form of a song. But... It did also illustrate a key emotional moment for a character. It also it it, cho it told us how the weather works in Equestria that the ponies have to make the weather happen, mm. but it also showed Twilight not knowing where her place was. Yeah. So that that was that's and I still you know hopefully I get to do something with music again. But for me, it's like songs indicate key emotional moments. Awesome. Well, if they're done right, so well done. Nicely <laughs> done. Awesome. Are you a big gamer? Is this something that you were familiar with, this world? I am not a big gamer, mm -hmm. which is really, I think a lot of people are surprised to hear that. Well, you're I'm, very busy, Lord. You're obviously very well, busy. Well, <laughs> I, I, I can't say, you know what's funny is I can't say that I ever was a gamer. Mm -hmm. Video games stress me out. It's really <laughs> weird. But I liked them, so I would watch my yeah. brothers play Street Fighter. Sure. <laughs> and I'd watch my husband play Zelda yeah. because I was actually really interested in them, but I didn't want to play them because <laughs> I would get too wrapped up and my anxiety levels would go up really high. Yeah. So I'm familiar. Like, I didn't get into games until they started doing the social games. Like, um, mm -hmm. I loved Animal Crossing yeah. and Harvest Moon. Those like, are great. Those are totally low stress. Yeah. <laughs> but there's story behind it. Well, not really Animal Crossing. Yeah. <laughs> if you make your own story. But, you know, so for me, and I, I've said this before, for, so I hope I'm not boring people. It was just that these guys were making... It was originally fighting his magic. Yeah. They were making a fighting game with the, the main characters from My Little Pony. And not only did it look great, mm -hmm. what I loved about it, and I think this kind of goes back to some of the things I've been saying here today, those girls were fighting in character. Yeah. It is so easy and so cheap to give a pony a gun. Ha, ha, ha. You know? Yeah. <laughs> like, it's this sweet, adorable thing being violent. Right. That's such a one-note joke. Right. And way too easy. I was watching these characters fight, and the things that we were doing reflected who they were. <laughs> that's incredible. And that's what I loved about it. Yeah. So, like, I was watching them. I was following it. I wanted them to finish. And, like, right before they finished, they yeah. got, you know, smacked with a cease and desist. Right, and right. I felt so bad for them. <laughs> so, originally, I just offered, you know, I was like, you guys made the game. Yeah. You know, you just don't own the characters. So I'll give you some characters. And all I was going to do was some character designs for yeah. them, let them go with it. But like the more I talked to them and the more we worked thing out, the like the more excited I got about it and the more, <laughs> you know, it just, it just, it's kind of blown up into this bigger thing. And I'm actually currently kind of writing the story lines so cool. of the characters and each of them kind of has their own journey yeah. so that you can follow each character up until they fight the boss at the end. Yeah. And I'm so excited because I'm giving them an emotional arc. <laughs> <laughs> You've talked about how uh, you have been seeing that more and more women are getting jobs in animation and different types of jobs, showrunners and, mm -hmm. and creators mm. and developers and mm -hmm. heads of story and all those kinds of different jobs. What's that been like? It's exciting. I got lucky 
um, compared to other women and in my time when I was young and I left college, mm-hmm. I had a teacher who offered me a job where I got to skip a lot of steps. Yeah. Most of my friends got stuck in a in a in feature films in a in a position called cleanup, which is the yeah. most unfortunate name. <laughs> um, especially for a job dominated by women. Um yeah. they saw it as an entry point and then you just get stuck there. And then I would see other young women who were artists who'd get their foot in the door as like a production assistant mm-hmm. and then they get stuck in production. Yeah. And part of that was because, you know, maybe people weren't being aggressive enough about getting out of that. And yep. I don't know if that's a self-esteem thing or a systematic girl, you're a girl, you can't do it. Mm-hmm. But it was also because, you know, the other showrunner, animator, art director, those bigger, more creative positions mm-hmm. were dominated by men. And when they needed somebody to help them out, they tend to hire their friends, which tend to, to be men. Right. Um, And it wasn't like a nepotism, like, he's my buddy. It was like, he's my friend. I'm very aware of his work and what he's capable of. I know him. And I know that he'll be good for this job where they don't know what that poor cleanup artist (laughs) on the third floor away from everybody else who can draw a really mean, clean line. Mm. They don't know what else she can do, so they don't go asking her. So I think women younger than me got a little more guts. Yeah, I think we raised our, you know, these. I think they were raised with a little bit more uh, self-esteem and freedom. Um, I always like to say that it took... You know, the current generation of fathers to want more for their daughters than just to marry a great guy and, you know, not get pregnant. And now men look at their little daughters and go like, I want her dreams to come true and I want her to be successful and I want her to be fulfilled and I want her to make a lot of money. You know, like, (laughs) so these girls are being raised with less oppression. Because a lot of these women, these that you're saying, are in these different positions: mm-hmm. storyboarders, d- character designers, showrunners, showrunners, and creators. <laughs> like that was unheard of. I know. And uh, they they've got the guts to go for it, and they've also got the guts to go. I don't want to be a PA. I got to get out of here. Yes, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think that's beautiful. And yeah. and what I'm excited about because especially creator showrunner is still pretty new. In terms of for women, mm-hmm. I, I want to hear those female voices. Yeah, I want to. I want to see it. I want to hear it. I want yeah. little girls to see it and hear it and feel okay about liking the things they like. Yeah, you know. Oh, and that all comes full circle. Oh, I get it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I see the now where. Okay, I'm trying to heal that little girl. That eight year old Lauren. Okay, great. Okay, cool. <laughs> I'm trying to tell her it's okay. Yes, you're allowed to like rainbows and glitter. Yeah. It's not. <laughs> Stupid! Can you tell us why it is important for girls and boys to have role models and stronger leads for female characters in the shows and stuff that they watch? You know, it seems so obvious, but I think there's still people out there who don't know this. Girls girls need to see it. Mm-hmm. You know, um, um, the Gina Davis Institute says um, if she can see it, she can be it. Yeah. Um, and I believe that. Girls, you know... Um, I read an article recently over the controversy over Ghostbusters, and this young woman was talking about how when she was 10, she would watch the cartoons that she loved. She was like me. She liked the boy cartoons. Right. And the girl, there was always one girl character, mm-hmm. and, you know, they were the, the roles that they had were so limited that when she was asked um, in middle school, I think, what she wanted to be when she grew up, she literally said secretary. Yeah. So that's why it's important for girls. Um, they need to know that they can do these bigger things. They need to know that they can be tough and strong. I have a big problem with you know the message that we give girls that everybody else's feelings and needs are more important than theirs. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that's the message in every girl's preschool show. Yeah. Everybody else's feelings are more important than yours. Yeah. It's like, well, their feelings are important, but her feelings are important too. Yeah. Um, and her goals and her dreams and her needs. And for boys, yes. it's... It's extremely important for boys because boys need to know that girls can be that way, too. We got to bring it around. You know, it's not just feminism. It's it's, it's equality. And it's like boys need to be okay with the idea that they can work for a girl and it doesn't demean them. Right. You know, a girl can be awesome. You can admire a girl or a woman. You can look up to a girl or a woman. You can make a girl or a woman your hero. And it... 
for little boys, the more they see that, the more it won't be weird. Right. You know, that's not going to be a change. Um, Jennifer Dodge here at Nickelodeon just told me recently at Comic-Con, she brought up this excellent point to me because we were talking about Steven Universe and Steven Universe, like My Little Pony, has a gender diverse audience. Totally. And why is that? And she said, uh, you know, little boys grew up watching Dora the Explorer and they never went why is it a girl? That's so (laughs) dumb. I'm not watching this. It's a girl because they were three. Right. You know, so like it didn't, they didn't question it. So it doesn't occur to them that a girl being a star or a girl being in charge is weird. I mean, the other thing is, and, and having girls, more girl characters doesn't really apply to this, but boys watching shows for girls. Mm -hmm. And and I think this happens with My Little Pony and a lot of My Little Pony fans. Boys need to know that it's okay to be sensitive and it's okay to be free. And if they've got these girl characters to look up to who, you know, and some of them are just, you know, guys with, you know, their characterization or just, you know, like a strong woman is a woman who acts like a man and that's not good. But, you know, these female characters are tough and admirable, but they've got this sensitive side or even showing male characters, for God's sake, who play these more, you know, um, uh, maybe a guy could be the secretary, you know, that it's okay for boys to like things for girls Mm -hmm. and not make them for girls anymore. They're for everybody. I absolutely agree. And once again, gracias, Dora. She really, uh, she really helped. <laughs> yeah. It totally, you know, you ask those kids, of course a girl can be an explorer. That of course makes sense. <laughs> You mentioned that you would love to do more projects with music. You're mm-hmm. working on a video game now, which is so cool. Mm-hmm. Is there any other dream projects, any other passion projects that you would like to work in that you maybe haven't had a chance to yet? Um, I am currently working on a novel. Isn't that <gasps> weird? <Wow. laughs> I don't know how that's going to turn out. Of course it's not weird. You're a storyteller. You're a writer. That's not weird, but that's awesome. Well, that was the bottom line for me was Mm -hmm. I just, you know, I I worked at, um, I was working on a feature film for about a year and a half and and unfortunately just kind of fell apart. It went really well for a long time, but there was a change of leadership and, and, you know, typical Mm -hmm. Hollywood story. But when I left that, I was kind of disappointed. A year and a half of work, a story I was really invested in and Mm -hmm. excited about. And I just went, what, what's my bottom line? What is my bottom line? And I was like, I just want to tell a story on my own terms. And what medium can I do that in? Because, you know, I'm very limited as an artist. Yeah. You know, I, like like if I tried to do comic books, you said nobody can produce a cartoon on their own, for God's sake. But right. People do web comics all the time. Sure. But I can't draw backgrounds. Yeah. So, like, what am I going to do? <laughs> you know? So, and I just felt like this is a medium where I don't have to hold back because there's not a budget. Right. I can make the world as big as I want. I can make the emotional arc as not typical as I want. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, don't, I can't, I don't have to just say the same old, you know, this character is has no self-esteem. By the end of the story, he's the hero. Like, I don't, I don't yeah. have to do that again, you know? Yeah. And I can make it as long as I want. I don't have to, you know, go, you got to cut out 15 minutes. Sure. What? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm dabbling in that. We'll, Very we'll cool. see how that goes. So I think that might, you know, I, I have a big, big, big idea that I've had for over 15 years. Wow. So the little, the story I'm writing now is kind of a one shot. It's a yeah. middle grade story okay. for like 10 year olds. And it's kind of like my practice story. Okay, for now, maybe for I now. Can, but maybe I can do that big one later. You're going to blow it up. You're going to do Tolkien it, right? Is You're going to you're gonna do the huge, massive, epic, maybe, maybe. series, maybe. <laughs> maybe. I have to ask, can you tell us anything about it? Can you tell us anything or is it too early? The, the little one that I'm writing now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I haven't talked about it a lot because I'm afraid if it doesn't work out, I'll look like an idiot. But (laughs) it's a um, kind of the elevator pitch is it's the friendship between a 13 year old witch and her cat. But her cat is but what it's supposed to do, it's supposed to reflect the you know how when you're like 10 and your best friend is 10 and you go and you do 10 year old things together. Yeah. By the time you're 13 one of you still a little 10, one of you's a little more 15. Yeah. And what happens to your relationship mm. when you're faced with that? So mm. the, the so the cat isn't her pet 
the cat is her friend. Cat is her friend, yeah. So like I'm and they're doing this in this big magical world of of witches and warlocks and, and familiars, you yeah. know, animals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's what I'm exploring now. And that's a that's a tricky subject. Yeah. Like you go pitch that to a studio and they're all like, Who Right. Who mm-hmm. can relate to that story? And I'm mm-hmm. all like, maybe just a few people, yeah. but <laughs> they'll really like it. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any last little piece of advice that you would like to give to to young people possibly looking to get into animation? I have a couple of things yeah. that I like to tell people. One is, you know, the importance of, you know, everybody knows it's important to get your foot in the door. If it's just an internship. Right. If you're a PA, those are important, but you really got to be proactive about moving out of that. That's, yeah. that's a big thing for me, uh, especially young women. And you have to do that by, you know, being friendly, talking to people, but making sure people see your work. Yes. And taking advice and taking direction because not only will that improve your work it'll show you hey i'm a team player and i can take direction and i can you know follow through on stuff Mm -hmm. you know it's funny because i'm i'm stubborn i'm very (laughs) stubborn and i started my career going no i'm right (laughs) i I didn't take advice and um i was getting stuck a lot Mm -hmm. and so i kind of pulled back and kind of late (laughs) i was in my 30s already by the time i went all right have to start listening to people. <laughs> and then I actually felt like I listened to them too much. Mm. And some stuff sort of started going. I, I stopped trusting my instincts. And I went, oh, okay, they have their job for a reason. Sure. And if they think this isn't going to work, I have to trust them. And then the stuff wouldn't work. And I yeah. went, like, I've got to try to find that balance, which I still struggle with mm-hmm. a, a lot. And the other thing, which I think is a little unusual, it's a little bit outside how to get a job or how to do your job. Yeah. This is a big thing for me, and I think this is a big reason that I've been successful. Live below your means. Great piece of advice. Don't live in the awesome apartment. Live in the crappy apartment. (laughs) Don't buy the awesome car. Buy a crappy car. You know, especially when you're young, because nobody judges you for that. And make sure... That you can save. Yes. So if you've got a lot of savings, if you've got six months worth of savings in your account, mm-hmm. you can be picky about your jobs. Yes. So you, if you get offered something kind of crappy on a project you think is lousy or working for somebody you think is a jerk, you yeah. don't have to take it because you've got – you can pay your bills. Yeah. You can wait for that awesome job. I worked – I did not work for – I think seven months mm-hmm. between Iron Giant and Powerpuff Girls. Because you had that savings, yeah. But I wanted Powerpuff Girls. Yeah. So, like, I had some other job opportunities come up, mm-hmm. and I was like, that eh, doesn't look like fun. Very practical and helpful it piece is. of advice. You know? It is. It's, but I had friends who, like, bought the awesome car yeah. and then had the crappy job. Yeah. <laughs> <you know? laughs> Absolutely. But, like you said, when you work on something that you love, you do better work. Yes. Which is beautiful. So. Yes. No, that's a huge, huge, yeah. huge thing. Well, thank you so much. I mean, I feel like My we can keep pleasure. talking. I know. Keep going. We're just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> but we are all out of time. But thank you so much again for stopping by. This was My awesome. My pleasure. This was super fun. Well, I hope that you guys enjoyed our conversation with Lauren Faust as much as I enjoyed talking with her. I was always a fan of her work, and now I am 100% a fan of Lauren Faust. Guys, you're not going to want to miss an episode of the podcast, so subscribe and keep sharing and telling people about the podcast wherever you get your podcast from. Leave a review if you'd like. It really helps us out. And be sure to visit nickanimationpodcast.com for tons of bonus content, all of the episodes, and even a photo of Lauren and I from today's record. Thanks to the awesome crew who puts this podcast podcast together. This podcast is produced by Jonathan Highlander, Dana vasquez Eberhardt, Kelly Smith, Andrew Hubner. Original music by Useful Creatures. All of the incredible social media for our podcast is made by Narbe Manassians, Sammy Armager. And thanks to the man who works at controls and makes me sound better than I have a right to, Manny Grava. Until next time, thanks for listening to the Nickelodeon Animation Podcast and keep watching cartoons. Mm-hmm.